Hey everybody, it's Kalen from Kite, the AI-powered coding assistant, and today we're going to explore the topic of deep fakes and examine a neural network designed to identify them called Masonet. The concept of deep fake refers to images, audio, or video that are fakes. That is, they depict events that never occurred, but unlike methods of manipulating media in the past, like Photoshop, these deep fakes are created by deep neural networks to be nearly indistinguishable from their real counterparts. Check out this video of President Obama addressing the nation, for example. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Did anything sound strange? That's because it wasn't Obama speaking, it was Jordan Peele. The advances in the field of deepfakes are equal parts impressive and alarming. On the upside, the fidelity with which we can alter media will certainly lead to some world-class memes. But in the wrong hands, this technology can be used to spread misinformation and undermine public trust, almost like a sci-fi type of identity theft where you can get anyone to say anything and its opposite. This means that as we get better at generating deepfakes, we must also get better at identifying them. Masonet is a convolutional neural network designed for exactly this purpose. In today's video, we'll use Masonet to make predictions on image data. We'll examine four sets of images, correctly identified deepfakes, correctly identified reels, misidentified deepfakes, and misidentified reels. And we'll see whether the human eye can pick up on any insights into the world of deepfakes. Let's begin with a brief discussion of Masonet. And by the way, you can find a link to the author's white paper in the description below. In the paper, the researchers explained that they had developed two different models to identify deepfakes, both of which were trained and evaluated on two different datasets. We will be using the MESO4 model trained on the deepfake dataset. Now let's begin by exploring how deepfakes are generated and how this dataset was assembled, and then we'll proceed to the model. Deepfakes can be generated by using autoencoders. At the highest level, autoencoders work like this. When the data are processed, such as image data, data get compressed by an encoder. The purpose of this compression is to suppress the effect of noise in the data and to reduce computational complexity. Conversely, the original image can be restored, at least approximately, by passing the compressed version of the image through a decoder. Now suppose we want to create a deep fake that blends Van Gogh's Starry Night and Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. To do so, when we train the autoencoders for different datasets, we allow the encoders to share weights while keeping their decoders separate. That way, an image of the Mona Lisa can be compressed according to a general logic, taking into account things like the illumination, position, and the expression of her face. But when it gets restored, this will be done according to the logic specific to the Starry Night, which has the effect of overlaying Van Gogh's distinctive style onto Da Vinci's masterpiece. Although this is how deepfakes are often generated, the authors note that their deepfake dataset was created differently. Rather than generating deepfakes from scratch, which they explain would limit the amount and diversity of the fake data that they could then feed Masonet, they chose to extract face images from existing deepfake videos. They used about 175 existing videos pulled from popular deepfake platforms, and that created their deepfake dataset. They explain that they extracted the specific frames that contain faces from the deepfake videos. They also note that they followed a similar process for extracting the real image data from real video sources like TV shows and movies. And finally, they explain how they stratified their data so that the various angles of the faces and levels of resolution were distributed evenly across the real and deepfake data sets. Since machine learning is all about finding patterns in data, it's actually extremely important to understand the nature of the data and how it is collected, because you're ultimately going to feed that through a model to understand it. As you'll see later, with this understanding of the data, we reveal some important insights. But stick around for that, let's first explore the model. MESO4 is a convolutional neural network with four convolutional blocks followed by one fully connected hidden layer. As we reproduce the model, we'll explain what each of these means, and you can find a link to the Masonet Authors repository in the description as well below. I want to take a minute to talk about Kite, which is an AI-powered coding assistant that'll help you code faster and smarter. Whether you're new to Python or already a pro, you should try out Kite as your autocomplete to reduce your keystrokes and save time programming. Kite is a free plugin for your code editor that uses machine learning to save you keystrokes while you're programming. So if you're using Atom, VS Code, Spider, PyCharm, Sublime, or Vim, 
Kite will seamlessly integrate into your coding workflow. Kite can complete entire lines of code, and it has a feature called Intelligent Snippets that will help you fill in arguments and method calls with variables defined earlier in your script. The window on the right side of my screen here is also a Kite feature called the Kite Copilot. It automatically shows you relevant Python documentation while you type based on your cursor location. This saves you time from having to Google search for docs. The best part of Kite is that it's free and you can download it from the link in the description below. Let's begin with our imports. And then let's create a dictionary called image dimensions to store our image dimensions which are the height and width of the image in pixels and the number of color channels. We set the height and the width to 256. And since we're using color images, we want to set the channels to three. Then we create a classifier class just as the authors had done, which makes for very neat code by prescribing just the essential methods for the network in simple terms. We will be using the methods to load weights and to make predictions. And next, let's create a Mesa 4 class. The Mesa 4 class takes just one argument, and that's the classifier class we just created. We set the gradient descent optimizer, and we set its learning rate in the constructor, and we set the parameters to compile the model. Now it's time to create the network architecture. We create a method called init model. First, we create our input layer and assign it to the variable x. For the input layer, we just need to pass the three dimensions of our image data. Then we create our four convolutional blocks. Convolutional blocks always include a convolutional layer and a max pooling layer. And in Masonet, these blocks also include a batch normalization layer. The convolutional layer represented by conv2d is the trickiest part. Here we set the size and the number of filters we will use in convolution. Check out this illustration. Here's how it works. Each filter represents a distinct image feature, for example, a horizontal line. During convolution, this filter is passed over an image to assess the degree to which specific regions of that image correspond with the filter. If you're a math whiz, this is done by calculating the dot product of the filter with each filter-sized region of the image for each of the color channels. For the rest of us, the important thing to know is that the filter identifies the existence and location of specific image features, like horizontal or vertical lines. After the convolutional layer comes the batch normalization layer. Batch normalization is a novel technique for improving the speed, performance, and stability of neural networks. It works by normalizing the inputs to each layer of the network which reduces the interdependence between the parameters for a given layer and the input distribution of the next layer. This interdependence is called internal covariate shift, and it has a destabilizing effect on the learning process. For more about batch normalization, check out the link in the description below. The last layer of our convolutional blocks is the pooling layer. It is in the pooling layer that we significantly reduce the dimensionality of our data, which greatly speeds up computation. Masonet uses max pooling for this layer, which means we reduce a region of pixel values to that region's maximum value. It may seem like we're throwing away too much data in this pooling layer, but remember, during convolution, our model was able to locate important image features, which means we can focus on just the parts that matter most. Think about your own visual field right now. Odds are you're focusing on a very small subset of the available data, just like Masonet. With successive blocks in the convolutional base, CNNs proceed to higher order feature representations, from lines to corners to shapes to faces. Masonet has four blocks in its convolutional base, followed by a fully connected hidden layer, and then the output layer for the prediction. Now that we've got the network architecture established, we need to instantiate the model and load the weights. We download the weights from the Masonet GitHub repo, and then save the file mesa4df in a folder called weights. We load the weights using the load method of our classifier by specifying the file path. Masonet is now ready to make predictions on image data, so next up, we start preparing our image data. We download the deepfake validation data set from the Masonet GitHub repo. Again, that's linked in the description below. We structure our real and deepfake image data in separate folders underneath a folder we call data. This is important for the flow from directory method, which infers classes from the file structure. 
The pixel values in our image data exist in the range between 0 and 255. Large integer coefficients like this complicate gradient descent when using typical learning rates. So, the next step is to scale our data by a factor of 1 divided by 255. That way, the pixel values fall into the range from 0 to 1. We instantiate our image data generator that rescales our images. Then we pass in our data by specifying the directory path to our data folder. We set the batch size to 1, so we process images individually. And then we set the class mode to binary for our binary classification task of predicting images as real or deep fake. Now, let's check our class indices. Flow from directory should have inferred the names of our classes from the names of the subfolders within the data folder. And there should be just two classes, where our deep fakes are represented by zero and our reals by one. There are two problems that might arise. First, if your classes are reversed such that your deep fakes are represented by one and the reals by zero, you'll have to flip Masonet predictions by subtracting these values from one. The second issue relates to having more than just two classes. As we discussed, flow from directory uses file structure to process data, and is therefore sensitive to the structure. Many IDs, including Jupyter Labs, which we're using today, will conduct periodic autosaves and store this data in hidden folders called IPYMB checkpoints. This extra folder compromises the flow from directory method, so we'll have to remove it. We can do this by opening our terminal, accessing the working directory that holds our data, and removing the hidden file. Or, we can do this directly from a Jupyter cell by using a magic command. We just type the exclamation mark to invoke the command line interface, and then issue our command to remove this file. After this, let's return the image data generator and recheck our class indices to ensure we successfully removed this autosave folder. Great, things are looking good now and we're ready to pass in an image through Masonet. The generator.next method returns two items, the pixel data of a given image and the actual label for it, whether it's real or a deep fake. So let's set variables x and y equal to generator.next. Let's write three print statements to evaluate the prediction. For the first, let's show Masonet's predicted output for the image rounded to four digits. For the second, let's show the actual label, and for the third, let's see whether Masonet's prediction is accurate. That is whether the actual label corresponds with Masonet's predicted output after rounding to zero or one. We can also see the image in question by using the mshow function from the matplotlib.pyplot package. Our X data currently has an extra dimension for its position in the batch, and this needs to be removed before mshow can properly render the image. We can do this by using the numpy function squeeze passing numpy.squeezex as the argument for plot m show. Now we can see how Masonet performed on a particular image. When predicted outputs are nearly 0 or 1, this corresponds with a high degree of confidence in the prediction. But when the predicted output approaches 0.5, the confidence in the model prediction approaches a random guess. So let's run this a few more times, and let's see if we see any patterns. Let's organize our predictions into four categories. Correctly predicted deepfakes, correctly predicted reels, misclassified deepfakes, and misclassified reels. And we create lists to keep track of which images fall into each category. Then we write a for loop to iterate through our data set and sort each observation into one of these four categories. We create two lists for each category, one to store the image data and the other to store the corresponding prediction value. Now let's create our plotter function, which we'll use to show random batches of images in each category. Plotter takes two arguments, a list of image data and the list of corresponding predictions. We use an f-string for the x-label so we can show Masonet's predicted output for the image in question. Let's check out a collection of correctly identified real images. We pass correct real and correct real pred into our plotter function. Checking out these images, things look pretty good. 
you might see some characters from TV or movies that you recognize here. Look at the predicted output for the images. The closer these values are to 1, the more confidence MasonNet has that the image is real. Notice that most of these outputs vary between a range pretty close to 1. Okay, for contrast, let's look at real images that were misclassified as deepfakes. Let's again use our plotter function, but this time we pass it misclassified real and misclassified real pred. Although these are all representing errors, it is reassuring to note that the model's confidence for these predictions tends to be closer to 0.5, and that's to say that it's less confident in these predictions that turned out to be wrong. So it's pretty much a guess, and I guess that's Okay. Now let's check our correctly identified deepfakes. Whoa. Okay, that's an odd pattern in our data there. And let's also check the deepfakes misclassified as real. We now return to MasonNet's method of collecting deepfake data. You may recall that they acquired deepfake image data from popular deepfake video platforms that are online. Well, according to the September 2019 report called The State of Deepfakes, conducted by DeepTrace Labs, 96% of deepfake media is pornographic. Deepfake pornography is among the worst abuses in the world of deepfakes, and besides being a significant social issue, this also complicates the technical side of our deepfake classifier. Here is why. Masonet was trained on real data acquired from TV and movies, sources that offer a great variety of facial expressions and settings. However, the deepfake data that the authors acquired was from popular deepfake platforms on the internet, sources that are overwhelmingly dominated by pornographic content. Therefore, it's expected that the model took advantage of a data artifact, the statistical reality that deepfakes tend to be pornographic and reels tend to be non-pornographic, and used it as a heuristic for its predictions. The authors explain that the models make predictions under real conditions of diffusion on the internet, which explains their use of popular deepfake platforms including pornographic websites. One wonders then, whether we could neutralize this effect and force the model to recognize deepfakes without the aid of statistical accidents by using some different data. Since deepfake data is limited in supply and overwhelmingly pornographic, we could acquire our real data from pornographic sites as well, rather than just TV shows and movies. And unlike deepfake data, pornography is relatively easy to find on the internet, or uh, so I've heard. Today we talked about deepfakes, what they are, how they're generated, and why they matter. We examined a model designed to identify deepfake images called MasonNet, and we implemented it to explore how it works. In doing so, we did encounter a problematic data artifact that an overwhelming amount of deepfake images are indeed pornographic. We explained why this matters, and we gave a suggestion for how we could potentially neutralize this effect. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video and that you learned something about deepfakes and neural nets. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more data science content like this, and remember to download Kite, the AI-powered coding assistant, so you can code faster and smarter.